The following is a Rudolf Steiner lecture given in November the 6th, 1916, and it's from the Karma of Vocation book. This is lecture three. Now I wish to approach the problem we are dealing with in these reflections from another point of departure. In spiritual science we must proceed so that we encircle the problem, in a sense, and approach it from various points and directions. When we observe a life such as Goethe's, one thing must strike us that may become a profound riddle in the evolution of humanity. This is so even when we take into consideration repeated lives on earth and include them in our deliberation of the moulding of a human life. The problem is this. What is the reason that individuals such as Goethe are capable of creating something so significant out of their inner nature, as he did especially through his Faust, and through this exert so important an influence on the rest of humanity? How does it happen that certain individuals are separated from the rest of humanity and are summoned by cosmic destiny to do something of such significance? We compare such an important life and work with that of each individual and ask ourselves what conclusion could be drawn from the difference between these individual lives and the lives of these preeminent persons? This question can be answered only when we observe life somewhat more thoroughly with the tools provided by spiritual science. To begin with, all that a person can know, especially in our time, is intended to conceal and disguise certain things and to keep unprejudiced reflections out of touch with them. This often makes it necessary in the sphere of spiritual science to adapt what we say to what can be understood by others. Now the description we generally give in spiritual science is that man consists of physical body, etheric body, astral body and ego. In explaining the alternation between waking and sleeping, we say that in the waking state, the ego and astral body are within the physical and etheric bodies, but during sleep, the ego and astral body are outside. This is adequate for a primary understanding, and it corresponds exactly with the spiritual scientific facts. But the truth is that we give only a part of the full reality in this description. We can never encompass the full reality in just one description, and thus we exhaust only part of anything we describe. We always need to seek light from other sources in order to properly illumine the part of reality already described. Here it must be stated that, speaking generally, sleeping and waking are really a sort of cyclic movement. Strictly speaking, the ego and astral body are outside the physical and etheric bodies in sleep, only in being outside the head. Because the ego and astral body in sleep are outside the physical and etheric head, they bring about a more vivid activity in the rest of the human organisation. It is indeed during sleep when the ego and astral body are working from without upon the human being, that everything in him that does not belong to the head but to other parts of his organisation is subjected to a far stronger influence of the ego and astral body than when he is awake. It may even be said that the action the ego and astral body bring to bear upon the head in the waking state is exerted upon the rest of the organism during sleep. We can, therefore, rightly compare the ego with the sun, which illumines our environment during the day, but during the night. It not only is outside of us, but lights the other side of the earth. So, likewise, it, is it day in the rest of our organism, when it is night for our sensory perception, which is primarily connected with the head, reciprocally, it is night for the rest of our organism, when it is day for our head. That is, the rest of our organism is more or less withdrawn from the ego and astral body when we are awake. If we wish to understand the entire human being, this is something that must be added to, to illumine the full reality. Now, it is important to grasp correctly the connection of the psychic with the physical in man if we wish to understand properly what I've just told you. I've often stressed the fact that the nervous system of the physical organism is a unified organisation. And it is really sheer nonsense, impossible to prove anatomically, 
to classify the nerves as sensory and motor. They are organised as a unity and all have one function. The so-called motor nerves are distinguished from the so-called sensory only to the extent that the sensory nerves were arranged to serve our perception of the outer world, whereas the motor nerves serve for the perception of our organism. It is not the function of a motor nerve to cause my hand to move, for example. This is sheer nonsense. It exists for the purpose of perceiving my hand's movement from within. The sensory nerves, however, serve in the perception of the outer world. This is their sole distinction. As you know, our nervous system is divided into three branches. Those nerves whose main centre is the brain, centred in the head, the nerves that are centred in the spinal cord, and the nerves that belong to the ganglionic system, autonomic nervous system. These are, in essence, the three kinds of nerves, and the important point is to know how they are related to the spiritual members of our organism which is the finest and most advanced member of the nervous system and which the least. Quite obviously, those who adhere to the ordinary scientific world conception will answer that the nervous system of the brain is naturally the noblest because it distinguishes man from the animal. But such is not the case. This nervous system of the brain is really connected with the entire organisation of the etheric body. Obviously, additional relationships exist everywhere, so that our brain system is naturally related to the astral body or the ego. But these are secondary relationships. Those between our nervous system of the brain and our etheric body are the primary original ones. This has nothing to do with the view I once presented in which I explained that the entire nervous system has been brought into existence with the help of the astral body. This is something quite different and must be kept quite distinct. In its original potentiality, the nervous system was brought into existence during the moon period. It has evolved further, however, and other relationships have been introduced since its first formation, so that our brain system really has its most intimate and important relationship with our etheric body. The spinal cord system has its most intimate and primary relationships with our present astral body. And the ganglion system is related with the actual ego. These are the primary relationships as they now exist. Considering all this, we shall readily see that an especially active relationship exists during the state of sleep between our ego and ganglionic system, which extends throughout the trunk of the body and sheath in the spinal cord. But these relationships are lessened during the waking life of day. They are more intimate during sleep, as are the relationships between the astral body and spinal cord nerves. We may say then that during sleep, especially intimate relationships obtain between our astral body and the nerves of the spinal cord, and between our ego and ganglionic system. To a greater or lesser degree, we live during sleep, as regards our ego, in a strong connection with our ganglionic system. Some day, through a thorough study of the puzzling world of dreams, people will come to know what I am here pointing out on the basis of spiritual scientific investigation. Taking this into consideration, you will arrive at a transition to another essentially important thought. Something significant for our life must be due to the rhythmical alternation that occurs in the living union between the ego and the ganglionic system and between the astral body and the spinal cord system. This rhythmical set alternation is identical with the alternation of sleeping and waking. Thus you will not be surprised when the statement is made that just because the ego is really so truly in the ganglionic system and the astral body is so truly in the spinal cord system, man wakes in relation to the ganglionic and spinal cord systems during sleep and sleeps in this relationship while awake. Here we can only ask how it comes about that so little is known of that vivid state of waking that must really be developed during sleep. Well, when you consider how man has come to be, that his ego has taken its place in him only during earthly existence and is, therefore, really the baby among his human members, it will not then seem amazing that this ego life cannot yet bring to consciousness 
what it experiences in the ganglionic system during sleep, whereas it can bring into full consciousness what it experiences when it is in the head, which is primarily the result of all those impulses that were at work during the moon, sun, etc. periods. What the ego can bring to consciousness depends on the instrument it can use. That used during the night is still comparatively delicate. As I pointed out in previous lectures, the rest of the organism really developed later than the head, has only been added later and is an appendage of the fully developed head organism. When we say that relative to his physical body, man has passed through longer or shorter stages beginning with Saturn, we are referring only to his head. What is attached to his head is in many ways a later formation of the moon period and even of the earth. It is for this reason that the vivid life that is developed during sleep and that has its organic seat to a large extent in the spinal cord and ganglionic systems enters consciousness at first only in a small degree. But it is not because of this a less significantly vivid life. One can say with equal justification that during sleep the possibility is offered to man to descend into his ganglionic system and that in the waking state the possibility is given to ascend into his senses and brain system. You will surely say, how this complicates and confuses everything that we have acquired. Man, however, is a complicated being and we do not learn to understand him when we fail to permit these complex complications to work upon us. Now just suppose that what I've described regarding Goethe actually happens to someone and his ferric body is loosened. Then an entirely different relationship comes about during the waking life between his soul spiritual and his organic physical nature. As I expressed it yesterday, he is put on a sort of isolated pedestal. But such an effect can never come about without being followed by another. It is important to bear in mind that such a relationship does not occur one-sidedly but brings about another. If one expresses what I characterised yesterday somewhat more crudely, we may even say that the loosening of the etheric body influences the entire waking life in such a certain way, but this cannot happen without also influencing the sleeping life. The result is simply that the person comes into looser relationships with his brain impressions. Because of this, he enters into more intimate relationships during the waking state with his spinal cord nerves and ganglionic system. At the time that Goethe fell ill, he developed, as it were, a looser relationship with his brain, but at the same time he experienced a more intimate relationship with his ganglionic and spinal cord systems. What is actually happening as a result of this experience? What does it mean to say that a more intimate relationship comes about with the ganglionic and spinal cord systems? It means that the individual enters into an entirely different relationship with the external world. We are, of course, always in the most intimate relationship with the outer world, but we merely fail to observe how intimate the relationship is. But I've often called your attention to the fact that the air that you hold within you at one moment is, in the next, outside, and then different air is taken in. Thus, what is outside takes on the form of the body and unites with it when you inhale. It is only seemingly true that the organism is distinct from the external world. It is a member of it and belongs to it. If, therefore, such a modification in an individual's relationship to the external world occurs as has been described, it makes itself felt strongly in his life. Indeed, it may be said that in such a personality as Goethe's, the lower nature, which we generally connect with the spinal cord and ganglionic systems, must come to the fore all the more strongly through this process. As the forces draw back from the head, the ganglionic and spinal cord systems take possession of them in larger measure. An understanding for what really happens here is acquired only when we permeate ourselves with the knowledge that what we call the intellect and reason is not really so closely bound up with our individuality as is ordinarily assumed. It is clear that contemporary basic conceptions of these things are completely wrong. In part, it is in these matters that contemporary views are least frequently right. This has been especially evident in the muddle-headed behaviour by some people in our age, including members of the most learned circles, 
when they tried to interpret their experiences with so-called dogs, apes, horses and such like. As you know, reports came out of the blue and were circulated about educated horses that can speak and do all sorts of things, about a highly educated dog that made a great stir in Manium, and an educated monkey in the Frankfurt Zoo that has been taught to do arithmetic, as well as other things that one cannot mention in polite society. The Frankfurt chimpanzee, in other words, has been trained in certain natural necessities to behave like humans rather than monkeys. I will not pursue this further, but all this caused the greatest astonishment not only among laymen, but also among professionals. They were actually enraptured, especially when the Manheen dog, after one of its beloved offspring died, wrote a letter telling how this dear puppy would be together with the archetypal soul, what it would be like, and so on. That dog wrote a most intelligent letter. Well, we need not elaborate on these specially complicated expressions of intelligence, but what stands out is that all these various animals performed feats of arithmetic. A great deal of attention was then given to the investigation of what such animals can achieve. Something quite unusual came to light in the case of the Frankfurt ape. It was possible to witness that when he was given a problem in addition to which he had to find a definite answer, he pointed to the correct number in a series placed side by side. It was then discovered that this educated ape simply formed the habit of being guided by the direction of the glance of his trainer. Then some of those who had previously been astonished said, He has no trace of a mind. His training is everything. In other words, the animal was taking his direction from his trainer and followed nothing more than a somewhat complicated training procedure. Just as a dog fetches a stone when it is thrown, so did the ape produce from the series of numbers the one indicated by the glance of his trainer. Upon more thorough investigation, similar findings will undoubtedly be obtained in experiments with the other animals. Whatever, we cannot suppress our astonishment that people are so amazed when animals perform something that is seemingly human. How much more objective understanding, how much intellect is actually associated with the so-called instinctual behaviour in animals? As a matter of fact, the enormously important achievements and profoundly significant connections in the animal realm cause us to admire the wisdom underlying all happenings. We do not have wisdom merely in our heads. Wisdom surrounds us everywhere like light, working everywhere, even through the animal kingdom. In the presence of such unusual phenomena as we have mentioned, only those people are astonished who have not seriously dealt with scientific development. To all those who today are writing such learned tracts on the Mannheim dog and other dogs, on horses and the Frankfurt ape, along with much else because these are not unique, to all these I should like to read a passage from Comparative Psychology by Carus that was published as early as 1866 since they are not here, I will read the passage to you. Carus writes, When, therefore, the dog, for example, has long been treated with kindness and affection by his master, the human traits imprint themselves upon the animal quite objectively, even though it has no conception of goodness as such. They blend with the sensory image of this person that the dog has often seen and cause the animal to recognise him, even apart from the sense of sight, merely through scent or hearing as the one from whom something good once came to him. If, therefore, some suffering befalls this man, if he is even deprived, perhaps, of the possibility of continuing his kindness to the dog, the animal feels this as something evil inflicted upon him, and is moved thereby to rage and revenge. All this occurs without any abstract thinking whatever, but only through the succession of one sensory image after another. End quote. It is certainly true that for the dog, sensory image follows sensory image. However, intelligence and wisdom are at the bottom of the phenomena. Carus continues as follows. Yet it is strange how closely actual thinking is approached and may be resembled in its results by such a peculiar weaving together, separating and again joining together of the images of the inner sense. Thus I once saw a well-trained white poodle that correctly picked out and placed together letters for words spoken to him. 
He also seemed to solve simple problems in arithmetic by bringing together figures written, as were the letters, on separate sheets of paper. He seemed to be able to count how many ladies were present in the company and did other similar things. Of course, if all this had depended upon a real understanding of number as a mathematical concept, it would not have been possible without actual reflection. It turned out, however, that the dog had simply been trained to pick up, on a slight gesture or sound from his master, the paper bearing the required letter or number from the series of sheets laid before him. Upon another indication, through an equally slight sound, like the clicking of the thumbnail against the nail of another finger, he would lay the sheet down in another row thus performing what seemed to be a miracle. End quote. You see, not only the phenomenon, but also its explanation has long been known. Only now is this explanation being furnished again by the scientists because people pay no attention to what has been accomplished in the past. It is only for this reason that such things occur, and they bear testimony, not to our advanced science, but to our advanced ignorance. On the other hand, certain objections have rightly been raised. If we had only these explanations, as we have heard them today, they might be considered equally naive, because Hermann Barr has quite correctly reminded us of the following. Herr Fumpfs demonstrated that the horses reacted to extremely slight cues made unconsciously and unperceived by their trainers. But Herr Fumpfs was able to perceive these slightly exceedingly slight gestures only after he had worked for a long time in his physiological laboratory constructing an apparatus to detect them. Barr justifiably raises the objection that it was certainly most peculiar that only the horse should be clever enough to observe the gestures, whereas a university instructor had to work for years constructing an apparatus to do so. I believe it took him ten or more years. In all such things there is obviously a bit of truth, but we must simply view them in the right way. With the proper perception one can obviously explain such phenomena only when one thinks of objective wisdom and understanding as qualities that, along with instinctive behaviour, have been instilled in things. And when one thinks of an animal as part of a complete system of interrelated objective wisdom permeating the world, in other words, they can be explained only when we are no longer limited to the idea that wisdom has come into the world through man alone, but recognise that wisdom is to be found throughout the universe. Man, by reason of his special organisation, is able to perceive more of this wisdom than other beings and is thus distinguished from them. Because of his organisation, he can perceive more than they. But through the wisdom implanted in them, they can perform wisdom-filled tasks as he can. It is, however, a different kind of wisdom. The phenomena of these unusual expressions of wisdoms are really far less important to serious observers of the world than the phenomena that are always spread out before their eyes. These are far more important and, if you take this into consideration, you will no longer find incomprehensible what I am about to say. An animal far more intentionally than man, fits into the universal wisdom and is quite intimately united with it. Its orders, so to speak, are far more compulsory than those of man. Human beings are much freer and so it is possible for them to reserve forces for the cognition of interrelationships. The essential point is that the physical body of an animal, especially the higher ones, is fitted into the same universal interrelationships as man's etheric body. Thus man knows more of the cosmic relationships, but animals are far more intimately reunited with them. They are far closer to and more interwoven with them. Therefore, if you take this objectively dominant reason into consideration, tell yourself this. We are surrounded not only by air and light, but also by governing reason. We do not move merely through illumined space, but also through the space of wisdom and governing reason. You will then fully understand what it means for a person to be fitted into the world in regard to the finer relationships of his or her organs, and not just in an ordinary way. In normal life, a man, for example, is joined to a spiritual cosmic relationship in such a fashion that the connection between his ego and ganglionic system, and between his astral body and spinal cord system, 
are greatly impaired during the waking life of day. But because these connections are subdued, he is not too attentive in ordinary, normal life to what is going on around him. It would be possible for him to observe this only if he really should see with his ganglionic system, as he otherwise perceives with his head. If, however, as in the special case of Goethe, the astral body is brought into a more vivid relationship with the spinal cord system and the ego with the ganglionic, because the ether body is withdrawn from the head, then far more vivid intercourse occurs with what is going on in our surroundings. But it is concealed from us in normal life because it is only while we are asleep at night that we enter into relationship with our spiritual environment. Here you arrive in an understanding of how the things Goethe has written for him. Genuine perceptions, and although these could naturally not have been so clear as our sensory perceptions of the external world, yet they are clearer than the perceptions that an ordinary man has of his spiritual environment. Now what did Goethe perceive in this way with special vividness? Let us grasp this point clearly for a special instance. Through the complications of his particular karma, Goethe was destined to enter a life of scholarship and knowledge differently from an ordinary scholar. What did he experience through this? You see, for many centuries it has been so that a man who grows into intimate union with a life of learning has experienced a significant discord. To be sure, today it is more concealed than in Goethe's time, but it nevertheless is experienced because there is an enormous field in science that has been preserved from the fourth post-Atlantean epoch in the terminologies and systems of words that we are compelled to acquire. We trade more than we realise in words. All this has been obscured somewhat through the experimentation that has gradually been introduced since the 19th century, and a person now grows into his knowledge so that he sees more than he did earlier. Such sciences as jurisprudence, for instance, have descended somewhat from the specially lofty positions they previously occupied. But when jurisprudence and theology still occupied their specially lofty stations, the areas of learning man was trying to penetrate were really comprehensive systems of words, and the same is true of other things that had to be taken in as an inheritance from the fourth post-Atlantean period. Along with this, what arises from the needs of the fifth post-Atlantean period made itself felt in an ever-increasing way, that is, the life that arises from the great achievements of the new period. This is not realised by anyone who is simply driven from one lecture to another, but Goethe experienced it most intensely. I say that a person who is simply driven from one lecture to another does not sense it, but he passes through it nonetheless. He really passes through it. Here we touch the edge of a certain mystery of modern life. We can judge students who are enrolled in courses according to what they experience and what they are conscious of, but what they experience is not the whole story. Their inner nature is something quite different. If these individuals who are experiencing these overlapping layers of the 4th and 5th post-Atlantean epochs really knew what a certain part of their being is going through unconsciously, they would then have an entirely different understanding of what Goethe, even in youth, concealed mysteriously in his Faust. Countless persons who are finding their way into contemporary education are unconsciously sharing in this experience. We must therefore remind ourselves that, by reason of all that Goethe had acquired because of his special karma, those with whom he came into close relationship during his youth were quite different to him than they would have been if he had not had this special karma. He sensed and felt how the people with whom he became intimately associated had to stupefy the Faustian life within them so that they no longer possessed it. He was able to sense this because what lived mysteriously in his fellow men made an impression on him such as is made by one person on another only when an especially intimate relationship, indeed when love, develops between them. In such a case of ordinary life, the connection of the ego with the ganglionic system and of the astral body with the spinal cord system is highly active, although this is not consciously perceived as such. Something very special is activated. 
But what is otherwise active only in a love relationship came about in Goethe vis-à-vis -vis a far larger number of people, so that he experienced a tremendous, more or less subconscious compassion for the poor fellows, excuse the expression, who did not know what their inner natures were going through as they were driven from class to class and from examination to examination. This was felt by him and it gave him a rich experience. Experiences become conceptions. Ordinary experiences become the conceptions of everyday life. But these particular experiences become the conceptions, the mental images that Goethe poured tumultuously into Faust. They were nothing but actual experiences that he gained from the most extensive environment because his ganglionic and spinal cord life was stimulated to more than normal wakefulness. This was the opposite from the subdued head life but it was a potentiality in him even in his boyhood. We can see this from his description of what became active in him, not only what ordinarily engages people, say in piano lessons, became active in him, but also the entire being. Goethe partook much more in the happenings of real life as a whole person than others, and we must say, therefore, that he was more wide awake during the day than they. During the time in his youth when he was working on Faust, he was more awake during the day, and because of this he also needed what I described yesterday as the time of sleep, the ten years in Weimar. This dampening was necessary. This, however, is just what happens to a greater or lesser degree in every human being during the course of life, only in Goethe it took place more intensely. He was simply drawn somewhat more consciously than other men into the surrounding wisdom-filled and purely spiritual influences. He became aware of what lives and weaves mysteriously within men. What, then, is this really? When we are put into the world in our ordinary and brutal waking life together with our ego, we are bound up with the world through our senses and our ordinary perceptions. But you will agree that we are now much more closely bound with this world. Our ego is indeed in an especially intimate relation with our ganglionic system and the astral body with the spinal cord system. Through this relationship we have really a far more comprehensive connection with our environing world than through the sensory system of our head. Now you must bear in mind that man needs the rhythmic alternation of his ego and astral body in his head during the waking life of day and outside his head during sleep because they are outside his head during sleep. They develop an inner active life in connection with the other systems as I have indicated. The ego and the astral body need this alternation of sinking downward into the head and rising out of it. When man's ego and astral body are outside his head he not only develops that intimate relationship with the rest of his organism through the ganglionic and spinal cord systems, but he also develops spiritual relationships with the spiritual world. Thus, we may say that an especially active, vivid connection with the spinal cord and ganglionic systems corresponds to an active, psychic, spiritual life with the spiritual world. Since we are obliged to assume that the soul spiritual is outside the head at night, and since this causes the development of an especially active life in the rest of the organism, we must then say that during the life of day, when the ego and the astral body are more within the head, we are in turn experiencing a spiritual symbiosis with the surrounding spiritual world. In a certain sense, we submerge ourselves in an inner spiritual world in sleep, but in a surrounding spiritual world when we awake. This state of being one with the surrounding spiritual world is more pronounced in Goethe. He is, as it were, dreaming during a state of wakefulness, just as the ordinary person does not always fall into a deep, dreamless sleep. It is seldom that anyone dreams consciously in this way during the life of the day, but people like Goethe pass into a state of dreaming even during the waking life. The forces that remain unconscious in other people become, in a certain sense, dream forms of life for people like Goethe. We now have an even more exact description which might tempt you to entertain the arrogant notion that all of you could easily write a Faust poem since you are experiencing the Faust dilemma 
by ranging out into and by living in union with the surrounding world during your daytime life. The latter is indeed true. We do experience spouse, but only as the opposite pole is experienced in the night through the ego and astral body, and we do not dream. But since Goethe not only experienced this unconsciously, but also dreamed it, he could express it in Faust. He dreamed this experience, and in people such as Goethe, the following takes place. What they create stands in the same relationship to what the rest of us experience unconsciously, as does the dream to deep sleep on the other side of our lives. This is an actual reality. The creation of the great spirits are related to the unconscious creations of other men as dream to dream this sleep. Even so, much remains obscure, but bear in mind that you are thereby gaining a glimpse into something that is intimately connected with human life. It may be described somewhat as follows. We could really say quite a bit about the connection between our being and the surrounding world if we could awake just to the stage of dreaming. If we were able to awaken only to the stage of dreaming, we would experience tremendous things and would also be able to describe them. But this would have a grave consequence. Just think, if all men, to express it trivially, were so conscious that they could describe everything in their environment, if they would really describe experiences, for example, like those of Goethe's as set forth, forth in his Faust, what would we come to? What would the world then come to? Strange as it may seem, but so it is, the world would come to a stop and would make no further progress. The moment everyone were to dream the way Goethe dreamt Faust, which is an utterly different kind of dreaming, the moment everyone were to dream his connection with the external world, then such people would devote all the forces developed in their inner being to such an activity. They would pour them into such things and human existence would, in some sense, consume itself. You can form a faint idea of what would happen if you just look at the many ruinous effects that have taken place because many people, although not really dreaming, Imagine that they are, and babble or scribble reminiscences they have picked up elsewhere. This is associated with the fact that there are entirely too many poets. Where is there anyone today who does not believe he is a poet or painter or something? The world would not continue if this were so, because all good things have also their dark side, truly their dark side. Schiller was also an important poet who dreamed much in the way I've described. Just imagine, however, that all those who in their youth were trained like Schiller to become doctors had given up the practice of medicine as he did, and later, thanks to an extensive patronage, had been appointed professor of history without any real preparation or serious study of history. As a matter of fact, Schiller did deliver interesting lectures at the University of Jena, but his students did not get for them what they needed to learn. He also gradually stopped giving these university lectures and was happy when he did not have to give them any more. Imagine that things would be the same with every professor of history or every young physician. Obviously everything that is good also has its dark side. The world must be protected, so to speak, from standing still. It seems trivial to say this, but it is nevertheless a profound mystery truth not all people can dream in this way. The forces with which they dream must first be applied in the external world to something different, so that through it a foundation may be created for a further evolution of the earth. It would come to a standstill were all men to dream, as I have indicated. Now we have reached a point where an especially paradoxical fact comes to light. To what in the world are the aforementioned forces really applied? If we observe their application in a spiritual way, they are ultimately applied to dream sleep, even though you might like them to be applied to dreams. More concretely, they are applied to all that is spread out over human evolution in the most varied kinds of vocational work. Vocational work is related to the work that was done in creating Faust or in Schiele's Wallenstein, as deep sleep is related to dreaming. But to say that we sleep during our vocational work will seem extraordinary to you, and you will say that here, in this, you are wide awake. 
The truth is that there is a grand illusion in this idea that one is awake during this kind of work, because what really comes into being through vocational work is not something we do in full waking consciousness. Of course, some of the effects a person's profession has upon his or her soul do enter one's consciousness, but such a person really knows nothing whatever of all that is actually present in the web of vocational labour that men are continually spinning around the world. It is indeed surprising how these things are connected. Hans Sachs was a shoemaker and also a poet. Jakob Bomber was a shoemaker and a mystical philosopher. There you have sleeping and waking alternating through a special constellation that we may also discuss. It is possible to pass from one state into another. What then is the significance of this interplay and alternation of life between vocational labour for such a man as Jakob Bomer, he really did make shoes for the good people of Gorlitz, and his mystical philosophical compositions? Many people have strange opinions of these things. Allow me to review the experience we once had when we were in Gorlitz. One evening, before a lecture I was to give on Burma, I got into a conversation with a high school teacher, in which we spoke about Burma statues that we had just seen in the park. The people of Gorlitz, as we were often told, called his monument the Park Cobbler. We remarked that it was most beautiful, but the school teacher said he did not think so. He thought it really looked like Shakespeare, and one would not know from it that Burma had been a shoemaker. He said that to represent Boma, it would have to show that he was a shoemaker. Well, one can disregard such an attitude as Jacob Boma has written his great mystical philosophical views. He was working from the results that could have come about only through the human being, having evolved through the Saturn, Sun, Moon and Earth times, that is, through the fact that a broad stream flows through these ages and finally comes to expression in these effects. This stream manifests itself in such a personality only in a way that is the result of special karmic relationships. But just as all that has traversed the sun and moon periods is necessary to every individual on earth, so it is also necessary, but in a special way, in order to bring out what was in Burma. But then Yaka Burma also made shoes for the worthy Gorlitzers. But how does all this hang together? To be sure, the fact that a man has been able to develop the skill of a shoemaker is also connected with this stream. But when the shoes are finished, they are separated from him, and their function has then nothing more to do with skill, but with protecting and warming feet. They go their own way in performing their functions, and are separated completely from the one who makes them. What they bring about has its, its effects only later. In other words, this is only a beginning. If the initial influence leading to the mystical philosophical activity of Jakob Bohm were represented graphically, I should have to indicate the first potential towards shoemaking here at this point. This then flows on further and in the future Vulcan evolution will have developed a degree of perfection that has been reached already by what had flowed into his mystical philosophical activity from the Saturn evolution. This is in a sense an end, his shoemaking is a beginning. We say, of course, that the Earth is Earth at present, but if we could trace things from Saturn still further back, we might then say that, relative to certain things, the Earth is already Vulcan. We should then assume Saturn at this point. We can thus take everything in a relative way. We may say that the Earth is Saturn and that Vulcan is, in a sense, Earth. What happens on the Earth is the vocational labour of a man like Jakob Bonn, not in his free creative work, but what he does as vocational labour is the beginning of something that will be as far advanced on Vulcan as the happenings on Saturn are already advanced on the Earth. For Burma to write his mystical philosophical books on Earth, it was necessary for something to have happened on Saturn that was similar to what he has done on Earth in making shoes. Likewise, Burma's shoemaking here on Earth has the effect that something may be done on Vulcan that would be similar to his writing mystical philosophy here on Earth. There is something extraordinary in all this. Here is an indication of how what is often given little value on Earth is so little esteemed because it is the beginning of something that will be prized in the future. In their being, human beings are, of course, 
much more intimately bound up with the past since they must first familiarise themselves with what is a beginning. Therefore, they often care much less for something that is a beginning than for something that has come over to them from the past. From the scope of what we are yet to be involved in during the Earth period, and so that something special may then come about when the Earth shall have developed further through Jupiter and Venus to Vulcan, from all this, a full consciousness will develop such as the one that it exists for the philosophy of Jakob Burma on the Earth. It is for this reason that the real meaning of human external labour is enveloped now in unconsciousness. Just as man was shrouded in unconsciousness on Saturn, sleep consciousness was developed on the Sun, dream consciousness on the Moon, and the present condition of waking consciousness on the Earth. The human being is thus really living in a profound sleep consciousness in his involvement with everything of his vocation. Through his vocation he is really creating, not through what gives him pleasure in it, but through what is developing without his being able to enter into it. Thus does he really create future values. When a person makes a now over and over again, it certainly does not give him or her any special pleasure. But the now becomes detached from its producer, it has quite definite tasks. As to what then happens by means of this now is not a further concern to the worker. He does not follow up every now he has made. But what is enveloped there in his unconscious, profoundest sleep is destined to come to life again in the future. We have thus been able to juxtapose what the ordinary person accomplishes. First, the most insignificant work in a profession, and then that which appears as the highest achievement. Superior achievements are an end. The most insignificant work is always a beginning. I wanted to place these two concepts side by side because we cannot reflect upon how the human being is bound through his karma with his vocation until we first know how his labour, which is often connected quite externally with him, is related to the entire evolution of which he is a part. We will soon develop the real question of karma as it relates to vocation. But I had first to introduce these matters so we must attain a universal concept of what flows from a human being into his or her vocation. These things are also exceedingly useful in forming our moral sentiments in the right way. Our judgments are incorrect because we do not focus our attention on things in the right way. A seed often appears quite insignificant beside the beautiful flower of the future. Using human work as a case in point, I wanted to show you today how seed and flower are bound up in the evolution of mankind. This is from Rudolf Steiner's set of lectures, The Karma of Vocation. This is Lecture 4. Someone might say that the spiritual scientific reflections touching on the problem of vocation are among the least interesting, but such is not the case. This must be recognised, especially in our fifth post-Atlantean period, because in this period all human relationships will be essentially modified in comparison with those that prevailed in earlier periods of the Earth. They will be so modified that man must, out of his own freedom, bring more with him than in earlier ages when his mission in the evolution of earth could be carried out almost instinctively, that is, when he received by inspiration the direction into which he had to go. When we look back, for example, to the Egypto-Chaldean culture, or to other cultures of earlier times, we shall find that the measure of freedom now given to man towards forging his external destiny, and this freedom will constantly increase, was not given to him in earlier times. During the Egypto-Chaldean period, the fact that each person belonged to a certain class into which he or she was forced similar to the way an animal is forced into its, its species, though not so irrevocably, removed from the sphere of man's freedom much that at present belongs there. To be sure, there was a compensation for this limitation of freedom. Students of the external history of culture who are generally quite short-sighted in their thinking 
usually assume that conditions in ancient times were such that those who were then guiding human affairs did so with the same impulses as the leading personalities today. But you must bear in mind that there were quite definite processes in the mysteries in ancient times whereby the guiding personalities acquainted themselves with what was willed by beings who guide life from regions outside the earth. I have told you that at certain times, we do not now need to review them, sacrificial priests carried out specified mystery rituals. As a result, certain personalities in the temples who were suited for such purposes were brought into contact with the universe, the cosmos, the extraterrestrial relationships. The consciousness of these specially qualified personalities was then inspired by beings who guided the earth from extraterrestrial regions and what was learned from these beings determined the course of action. I will show you through a hypothetical case how things took their course in earlier times. Suppose that today the Christmas festival was not more or less an external holiday for most people, but that in its form and time of occurrence men knew that our earth is especially fitted to receive ideas into its aura that cannot enter, for example, in summer. I have explained how the earth is awake during the winter and that Christmas time is one of the most brilliant points of this waking state. At that time the aura of the earth is permeated, interwoven with thoughts. We may say that the earth is permeated, interwoven with thoughts. We may say that the earth ponders the outer universe, just as we men, while in the waking state of day, reflect in our thought on what is around us. In summer the earth sleeps, so it is not possible then to find certain faults in it. In winter the earth is awake and most wide awake at Christmas. Then the earth's aura is interpenetrated with faults, and it is possible to read the will of the cosmos for our earthly events from them. Now the sacrificial priests educated some individuals in such a way that they became sensitive and receptive to what was alive in the earth's aura. By putting these individuals into contact with the earthly force that gave expression to the cosmic will, the sacrificial priests in the temples could learn it from them. What they learned was to them, in a sense, the will of heaven, and from this they were able to determine who should remain in a particularly worthy position and who should be taken into the mysteries in order that he might assume a leading position in ancient government or priestly life. Humanity has now outgrown such things and is exposed to chaos in this respect. We must simply recognise this fact. The transition from the ancient, quite definite conditions in which men learned from the will of the gods what was to happen here on earth has already occurred. During the fourth post-Atlantean period, in which the individual freed himself from the will of the cosmos, these ancient customs passed over into our present more chaotic conditions. Everything tends to be handed over more completely to man. Thus, it is all the more necessary that the will of the cosmos shall penetrate earthly conditions in another way. It would require much time to make clear how, in the third Egypto-Babylonian culture period, something still lived and wove in earthly life from the various vocations of men, to use a term adapted to our present conditions, that was in large measure a reproduction of the will of the cosmos. This came about as described and was disappearing during the fourth post-Atlantean period. It has vanished completely in our fifth post-Atlantean period, which began, as we know, approximately in the 15th century. If men would pay more attention today to what is happening and stop offering a fable convenure in place of history, they would be able to recognise even from external conditions, how man's relation to his vocation has changed since the 14th and 15th centuries. They would recognise from present conditions how everything will increasingly become different in the future. But a sort of anarchy would inevitably overtake mankind if no one were to grasp these deeper connections and impart to the intellectual community ideas that take into account the modifications produced by the natural course of evolution. What it has been possible to establish even from external history regarding the emergence of what we might call the modern vocational life 
since the 15th century would cause astonishment to those who are at all able to observe human life. If they would submit to the influence of all that it is possible to recognise, they would find fault with themselves, in a way, for living in such a somnolent state and for having no conception of what is connected with evolving human destiny. Last time I called your attention to the fact that what constitutes real vocational life is by no means so insignificant for the cosmic complex as it may at first appear. I pointed out that, as men, we have gone successfully through the Saturn evolution, where the first potentialities of the physical body were prepared, the sun period in which the etheric man was prepared, the moon period in which the astral man was prepared, and that we are now passing through the earth period in which the ego develops. But other periods are to follow, the Jupiter, Venus and Vulcan times. We may say that the Earth is, in a way, the fourth stage of Saturn, likewise Vulcan is the fourth stage of the Earth. The Earth is, in a sense, the Saturn of Vulcan. Just as on ancient Saturn processes occurred so intimately bound up with evolution that we owe the first potentiality of our physical body to them, which still continues to work in us, so something must happen on Earth that will continue to work on in our evolution. On Vulcan it will attain a fourth stage of development, just as certain processes on Saturn have reached a fourth stage of development on Earth. I pointed out that those processes that would correspond to Vulcan correspond to what we have on Earth from the Saturn evolution. They represent, therefore, what works and lives in the various vocations that men take up on Earth. As humans pursue vocational lives, something develops on Earth within their vocational activity that will be the first potentiality for Vulcan, just as the Saturn activity was the first potentiality for our physical body. If you add to this reflection the fact that vocational life has undergone a tremendous transformation since the beginning of the fifth post-Atlantean period, you will understand how increasingly important it will become to conceive of it as a component of the entire world evolution, provided you do this by means of those points of view that may be developed through spiritual science. Only by learning first to recognise the objective aspects of vocational life can we form suitable concepts regarding the karma of vocation. Of even greater interest will be the question where vocational life is going and what it will develop into from our age onward, because from this we shall derive more clear-cut concepts than from today's conditions. As can easily be recognised, when we take a common sense look out into the world today, the future evolution of vocational life will consist in the ever-increasing differentiation and specialisation of vocations. It is not too intelligent for people to criticise the fact that in recent times, vocations have become more specialised and not, not so many centuries ago, a person could find in his vocation the connections between what he was producing and what this meant for the world. He thereby would take an interest in the forming and shaping of his product because he saw clearly what his product became in life. In our times, this is no longer the case for much of humanity. To take a radical example, a man is placed by his destiny in a factory where he perhaps makes not a whole now, but only part of one. This piece is then joined with another part by another man. Thus the man who makes only part of the now can develop no interest in how what he produced from morning until night takes its place in the relationships of life. If we compare the earlier handicraft life with the factory life of today, we are immediately aware of a radical difference between what is contemporary and what existed not too long ago. What has already come to pass in the various branches of human activity will continue to develop, and more specialisation and differentiation of vocational life will necessarily occur. It is by no means especially intelligent for people to criticise this, because it is a necessity in evolution. It simply will happen, and will happen more and more. What sort of outlook is open to us by this fact? Fundamentally, it is that men must increasingly lose interest, as we can readily imagine in the work that occupies the greater part of their lives, 
In a way, they must surrender like automatons to their work in the world. But the most essential point is something else. Man's inner nature must obviously acquire the colour of his outer work. Anyone who observes the historic development of humanity will certainly discover to what a large extent the men of the recent fifth post-Atlantean period have become reproductions of their vocations and how their vocational lives influence their soul lives, specialising them. This does not apply to the majority of those who live today within our anthroposophical society, however. They are often in the fortunate position of having detached themselves from the interconnections of life. In the fortunate position? I might just as well say in the unfortunate position. This is good fortune, often only for subjective egoistic feeling. For the world it is often bad fortune because the world will demand increasingly of men that they excel in special fields and become specialists. But what must happen in addition to this? Their specialisation will be a necessary byproduct of world evolution and this question will soon become one of the weightiest of family problems. Anyone who wishes to educate children will have to understand it. To place oneself rationally within the course of evolution then will depend altogether upon an understanding of the question, how shall I place my child into the evolution of humanity? What is still possible in many cases today, even though it is only a residue left over from ancient times that people routinely cling to, will soon prove to be empty phrases. That is, the fine manner of speaking so much admired today, according to which children must be allowed to become what corresponds to their observed talents. This will soon prove to be an empty phrase. In the first place, people will see that those who are born from now on will give indications of their previous incarnations in a more complex way than was the case with people in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch. They will show complex potentialities that no one would have dreamed of before since these potentialities were far simpler in earlier times. Those who consider themselves especially clever in testing the potentialities of grown children to determine whether or not they are fitted for this or that vocation may learn that the insights derived from these tests are nothing but their own fantastic imaginations. In the near future, however, Life will be so complicated that the word profession will take on an entirely different meaning. Today we still often associate something quite inward with the word, calling it vocation, although for most people their vocations do not at all represent anything inward. We conceive vocation, calling, as something towards which a person is called by his inner qualities. However, if we would question people about their calling, especially in our cities, many would say, I am in my profession because I am convinced this is the only one that corresponds to my talents and inclinations that I have had since childhood. Yet closer inspection of these cases would reveal that the answers given did not correspond with the facts, and I imagine they are not concurrent with your own observation of life. Today, a vocation is increasingly that to which a person is called by the world's objective course of development. There, outside of men, is the organism, the interconnection, you may call it, if you please, the machine. This is not important, that gives orders that cause him. All this will constantly intensify, and as a result, what humanity accomplishes through got vocational activity is also detached from man himself. It becomes more objective. Through this detachment, vocational activity grows increasingly into something that, in its further development through Jupiter, Venus and Vulcan, goes through a process of development similar to what has taken place for the Earth through Saturn, Sun and Moon. It is a peculiar fact that when one speaks as a spiritual scientist, it is not possible to flatter human beings if the subject is related intimately to their lives. Spiritual science will be less and less exposed, you see, to the danger of expressing itself according to the model of wisdom to be found in the words, at best a pompous moralistic play with wonderfully edifying quips most suitable to come from puppet's lips. And that's from Faust.
Spiritual science will certainly not be in a position to do this. It will often be compelled to set forth for something significantly great for the evolution of the world, the very thing that people would prefer not to hear. It would therefore be inevitable that some people today who consider themselves exceedingly bright because their philistinism has crept into their brains will glibly declare, oh, professional life is a prosaic, mundane matter. The way vocational life appears to true spiritual science compels us to declare that through the very fact that this life becomes detached from human interest, it contains the necessity to develop relationships possessing a cosmic significance. Many people might think that a depressing view of the future results from this. Increasingly, people are caught in the treadmill of life and spiritual science cannot even console them that this has happened. It would, however, be a great deception should one draw such a conclusion from what has been said since the nature of the universe requires things to be unified through polar opposites. Just consider how these polarities thrust themselves upon you in the world. It is, for example, in their mutual relationship that positive and negative electricity produce their unified effects. Positive and negative electricity are necessary to each other. Male and female are necessary for the propagation of the human race. It is from polarities that unity evolves in the evolution of the world. Now the same principle is at the bottom of what has been said. When vocational labour is separated from the human being, we necessarily create the first cosmic potentiality for a far-reaching cosmic evolution. Everything that happens in the evolution of the world is related to the spiritual and in what we create within the sphere of our vocations, whether by bodily or by mental labour. There lies the possibility for the incarnation of spiritual beings. At present, during this earth stage, these spiritual beings are, to be sure, still of an elemental kind. We might say an elemental kind of the fourth degree. But they will have become elemental beings of the third degree during the Jupiter evolution and so on. The labour in the objective vocational process is detached from us and becomes the external sheath for elemental beings who thereby continue their development. But this occurs only under a certain condition. If it be said that we must first begin to understand the meaning of what is often belittled as the prosaic part of life, we must also understand that this meaning is not clarified until we comprehend it completely in its comprehensive cosmic connection. What we produce in our vocational life can become meaningful for the Vulcan evolution but something else is prerequisite to this. Just as positive electricity is necessary for negative and the male necessary for the female, so also what will be released continuously from humanity as activity will require an opposite pole. A polarity of opposites was also present for humanity in its earlier evolutionary stages. Something absolutely new, of course, does not come into existence here because something similar was already present before. But when you look back at earlier cultural periods, if only two or three centuries ago, you will find that the human being was still far more immersed in his professional life with his feelings and passions, in fact with all his emotions, than today. When you compare the joy that a human being could still experience in his or her profession even a hundred years ago with the dissatisfaction of many people today, who have nothing but their profession, you will be able to form an impression of what really needs to be said. Such things are really considered rightly far too infrequently for the simple reason that those who discuss the character and choice of vocation are those who can least afford to talk about this subject matter. Schoolmasters, literary scholars, parsons, the very people who least experience the dark side of vocational activity in the modern world write about these things. Thus you will find in ordinary literature and even in pedagogical books that people express themselves on this subject like the blind discussing colours. Of course, someone who has finished elementary and high school and then looked around a little in a university because that's the thing to do 
may easily consider himself unusually clever with the ideas he has absorbed. That is, if he now plays the role of a reformer of humanity who can tell us how everything should be done. There are indeed many such individuals. A person who has gained a proper perception of life knows that they are the ones who usually talk most stupidly about what must come about. This is ordinarily not observed simply because those who have acquired such educational credentials are at present highly respected. The time is yet to come when the feeling will develop that the so-called men of letters, the journalists and narrowly educated schoolmasters understand the interrelationships of life least of all. This must gradually develop as a general opinion. It is important that we come to see more clearly how in earlier times man's emotional life was intricately related with his professional life and how subsequently the latter has increasingly become disengaged from man's emotional life and must continue to do so. For this reason, the polar opposite of vocational life must become something different from what it was earlier. What was this element that was added earlier to vocational life? You have it before you today when you consider what constitutes the shell of culture, the buildings in which professions are practised and in the midst of these, the church have become the sheaf and shell of culture, the days of the week reserved for work and Sunday reserved for the needs of the soul. These were the two poles, the vocational life and the life dedicated to religious conceptions. It would be one of the greatest mistakes that could be made to suppose that this other pole as it is, still conceived today by the religious denominations, could remain as it is, since it was made to fit a vocational life still bound up with the emotions of men. All of human life will deteriorate unless understanding increases in this sphere. So long as the elemental spirit that an individual creates in his vocation, as I have described, was not separated from him, the old religious conceptions still suffice to some extent. Today they are no longer sufficient and they will become less so the further we advance into the future. The very idea that is most opposed by certain people must be revived, that is, the opposite pole, consisting of the fact that men should be able to form concrete concepts regarding the spiritual worlds, should enter into evolution. The representatives of the religious sects will often say, Oh, there they are in spiritual science, talking about many spirits and gods, but it is the one God that is important, with him alone we have enough. Thus we can still make an impression on people today if we present them with the great advantage of coming into contact with one God, especially during after dinner coffee and family music when contemptuous remarks are made about other more recent endeavours and ideas are expressed in an especially egoistic and philistine fashion. But what is really important is that human horizons should be broadened, that is, that we should learn to know that everything is permeated not just by a single divine spirit conceived in the vaguest way possible, but that spirit is also omnipresent in a concrete special sense. People must learn to know that when a workman stands at his vice and the sparks fly about, elemental spirits are being created which pass over into the world process and there have their significance. Those especially clever ones will claim that this is stupid. These elemental spirits, however, will certainly come into existence even though the one working at the vice is unconscious of them. Nevertheless, they will still be created, and it is important that they shall come into existence in the right way, since elemental spirits, both destructive and helpful to the world, process can come into being. You will most clearly understand what I mean if you consider it in a special context, because in all these things we are standing today at the threshold of new evolutionary development. Many people already have an inkling of this. Should it be transformed into reality and people fail to have spiritual scientific aspirations, it would be the worst thing that could happen to the earth. What has come about primarily during the course of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch is that the human being has been liberated from the external, inorganic world which he embodied in his tools. 
eventually he will be reunited with what he has embodied in them. Today, machines are constructed. Of course, they are at present objective, containing little of the human element. But it will not always be so. The course of the world tends to bring about a connection between what the human being is and what he produces and brings into existence. This connection will become ever more intimate. It will appear first in those areas that furnish the foundation for closer relations between one person and another, for example in the treatment of chemical substances that are used in medicine. People still believe that when sulphur, oxygen and some other substance, hydrogen or something else, have been combined, the product of this combination possesses only those effects that are derived from the individual substances. Today this is still true to a large extent, but the course of world evolution is tending towards something different. The subtle pulsations lying in the human being's life of will and disposition will weave and incorporate themselves gradually into what he produces. Thus, it will not be a matter of indifference from whom a certain preparation is received. Even the most external and cold technical development tends towards a quite definite goal. Anyone who can form a vague conception of the future of technical development knows that an entire factory will operate in a completely individual way that will be in keeping with the one who directs it. His or her attitude of mind will enter into the factory and will pass over into the way in which the machines work. Human beings will blend with this objectivity. Everything that they touch will gradually come to bear a human impression. No matter how stupid it may seem today to the clever people, in spite of St. Paul having said that what men consider to be clever is often foolishness in the eyes of God, people will realise that the time will come when an individual will be able to step up to a mechanism standing at rest and will know that to set it in motion he must move his hand this way, that way and another way. Through the vibrations of the air caused by this signal, the motor, adjusted beforehand to respond to it, will be set in motion. Then national economic development will become such that to pattern machines will be quite impossible. Such things will be replaced by what I have just explained. Thus everything will be excluded that has no relation to human nature. And by this it will be possible to bring about something quite definite. Just imagine what a truly good person who has reached an especially high level of morality will in future be able to do. He will construct machines with signals that can be governed only by the individuals like himself. Evil-minded people will produce quite different vibrations when they make these signals and the machine will not respond. People already have a faint inkling of this. It is not without purpose that I have called your attention to certain individuals who study flames dancing under the influence of definite tones. Further research in this direction will reveal the way to what I have just indicated. We might indeed say that it is the path back to those times when an alchemist who only wished to stuff money into his pocket could accomplish nothing, whereas another, who wished only to set up a sacrament for the glory of the gods and the welfare of humanity, would be successful. In a sense, so long as what arose from human work bore the aura of the emotions and joys that men transferred into it. It was not accessible to the kind of influence that I have just described, but to the extent that the products of vocational labour can no longer be produced with special and absolutely necessary enthusiasm. What thus flows away from men and streams forth from them can become a motor ball. The truth is, that through the facts that individuals can no longer unite their emotions with the world of machinery, they, in a way, restore to this world the purity that arises from or serves their labour. In the future, it will no longer be possible for people to bestow the warmth gained from the enthusiasm and joy derived from their work on the things produced. But these things themselves will be pure as they are put into the world by workers. They will also become more susceptible to what will emanate from and be predetermined by man as a motive force, as I have described. Such a direction to human evolution can only be given by concrete knowledge of the spiritual forces that can be discovered by spiritual science. 
In order that this development may occur, it is necessary for an even greater number of individuals in the world to gradually find the opposite pole. This consists in uniting one human being with another in what rises far above all vocational labour, while at the same time illumining and permeating it. Life in the spiritual scientific movement furnishes the foundation for a united life that combined all professions together. If there were only an external advance of vocational involution, this would result in a dissolution of human ties. People would become less able to understand one another or to develop relationships according to the requirements of human nature. They would increasingly disregard one another, seek only their own advantage and have only competitive relationships with one another. This must not be permitted to come to pass, lest humanity thereby fall into complete decadence. To prevent this from happening, spiritual science must be propagated. It is possible to describe truly what many people are today unconsciously striving for, even though they deny it. There are many today, you know, who say, This talk about the spiritual is ancient twaddle. The true advance that will really bring about human progress is to be found in the development of the physical sciences. When men get beyond all this twaddle about spiritual things, we will then, in a way, have a paradise on earth. Should nothing prevail in humanity except competition and the compensatory acquisitive instinct, however, it would not be paradise on earth but hell. After all, there would have to be another pole if real progress were to take place. If a spiritual pole were not sought for, there would have to be an aromanic one. Then the following argument would prevail. Should vocations continue to be specialised, there would always be a certain unity in that one person would be this, another that, but all would have the common characteristic of acquiring as much as possible through their jobs. True, all would be made alike, but this is simply an aromatic principle. It is incorrect to think that the world can reach its goal through such a one-sided evolution, proceeding purely in the external sphere as we have described it. To follow this line of thinking would be tantamount to a woman's arguing that men had gradually become worse, were really are unfit for the world and should be completely exterminated and that then we could get the right evolution of the physical world. It would require a weird person indeed to hold such a view since nothing whatever could be achieved by getting rid of all the men. Because this applies to the sensory world, people understand it but they do not understand such foolishness in reference to the spiritual world. Yet it is the same for spiritual relationships, as if someone were to suppose that mere external evolution could continue to progress. It cannot. Just as the earlier evolutionary periods required the abstract religions, so this new stage requires a more concrete spiritual knowledge, as it is striven for in the spiritual scientific movement. The elemental beings that are created and released through the vocational labour of men must be fructified by the human soul with what it takes into itself from impulses striving upward to the spiritual regions. Not that this is the only mission of spiritual science, but it is the mission related to the advancing and changing vocational life. Therefore, world evolution demands that as professions become more specialised and mechanised, people feel the need for the opposite pole to become proportionately more intensely active in them. This means that each human being should fill his soul with what brings him close to every other human being, no matter what their specialised work may be. All this leads to much more. As we will hear in due course, a new age will emerge from what we may describe as our own times indifference to and withdrawal from life which is frequently the experience of working people these days. In the new age, human beings will again perform their work from different impulses. These will really be no worse than those good old vocational impulses that cannot be renewed, but must be replaced by others of a different sort. In this connection, we could already point today, not merely abstractly, but quite correctly, to a human ideal that spiritual science will develop. 
This will show what even a vocation may become to human beings when they understand how to observe the signs of the times in the right manner. We shall continue our reflections regarding the significance of these matters for the individual and for karma.